So, okay, uh, my name is Antoinette van der Merwe, and it's also my privilege to, to welcome here you this morning on behalf of Stellenbosch University. Um, you will see the presentation this morning has both my name and Professor Squinwinkel's name on there. He's going to be joining us at two o'clock this afternoon. Unfortunately, he can't join us this morning early because he's got a few institutional meetings that he could unfortunately not get out of this morning. Um, but it is a joint presentation um, by us both. And I will stop at a certain slide, which will give the forward perspective, and you will pick up in the afternoon um, to, to actually continue the presentation. So this is a joint presentation. Um, what we chose to do um, ties into the theme, um, and I'm going to, throughout the presentation, also try and link it to the theme of this colloquium. Um, I also want to encourage you to listen carefully and Although I'm going to present a quite specific case study of Stellenbosch University or our strategy to pick up on some of the issues where sharing and networking can happen. Um, the reason being, I don't know who have come across the most recent draft national plan for post-school education and training um, formulated in November 2017 and we were asked to comment on it. Our comments from our university actually had to be in on the 15th of April so it's quite fresh in my whole memory. Uh, we also had a workshop in the Western Cape on the 1st of March about this national or draft national plan for post-school education and training, which is supposed to actually replace the previous um, plan for higher education or post-school education and training. And I just took out one, one little quote from there because I do think it, in a very limited um, amount, albeit, does speak to creating further networks about sharing within the higher education context within South Africa. In order to replicate what is working well in some institutions and to initiate new possibilities, the department will encourage and support collaborative technology enhanced teaching and learning projects through the collaborative projects component of the university capacity development program. And at Stellenbosch University, of course, we have our own university capacity development grant projects running. But I think this is a wonderful vehicle for us, and I would like us to think about it possibly also for the closing session right at the end, how we could leverage some funding from the University Capacity Development Program, specifically focusing on the collaborative pro projects between universities to actually get some conversations going and some projects going as well. Having said that, um, I think going back to the topic of my presentation, um, I do want to share with you what's been happening at Stellenbosch University in, t in terms of developing an integrated ICT strategy, um, as well as Professor Schoenwinkel this afternoon will share something more about forward-looking, where we're moving towards, as well as how we aim to get sustainability, because I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we could face. Um, so first of all, the hype, of course, uh, I've been coming in this business and I recognize quite a number of faces of colleagues um, in the audience for 20, 21 years. So um, there's been a, a lot of hype about what um, information technology can do in for higher education. Uh, just to, um, I didn't put Trump on here, I don't know what he would be saying, possibly something much more rash but even Obama in 2011 talked about out-educating, out-hustling the rest of the world, and this was in the context of using information communication technologies in, in higher education. So this was even in 2011. But of course, this is nothing new. If we go back to 1900, um, you can see there was a lot of hype around there as well. There's a little guy putting a lot of books into a, a funny-looking machine connected to students' ears, and of course this is also a very primitive, albeit, but already in 1900 there were lots of promises and hypes as to how, how information communication technologies, learning technologies, can actually change teaching and learning as we know it. So I think at Stellenbosch University we're acutely aware of the hype surrounding um, the use of learning technologies in teaching and learning, and in terms of our context, I think we were very careful um, in terms of formulating what we want to achieve through learning technologies. First of all, by taking into account our institutional intent and strategy, 
uh, which is currently under revision, so <laughs> you're still dealing with the old one, which says Stellenbosch wants to be innovative, future-focused, and inclusive. Now, this, I think, would also resonate with most of the other institutions that are in the room today. You've got similar types of institutional intents and strategies. Then, of course, in terms of our learning and teaching environmental plan of the Vice Rector Learning and Teaching, he also, together with us as uh, divisional heads, formulated the environmental plan which promotes excellence, program renewal, remember that one, because that's one of our powerful hooks that we hooked on to at Stellenbosch University. ICT in learning and teaching, size and shape, and new knowledge markets. And all of those will become relevant as the presentation goes along. And I'm also sure resonates with the institutions, the external institutions in the room. Then um, I think what really um, came to the fore specifically in the last five years that I would like to talk about, not that it wasn't there in the previous 15 years that I've been involved in, in this type of endeavor, was the institutional will and leadership. Um, and I think, again, speaking from my own experience, but I think it's also shared in the room, that is a necessary, necessary um, enabler in terms of the use of ICTs in teaching and learning. Of course, there's been many early adopters over the past 20 years, and we've seen it growing into faculty adoption strategies. I see some vice deans here, teaching and learning, Ingrid from um, science, Marta from EMS, Marta, um, who's been the blended learning coordinator there. So there's been a lot happening within faculty. Susan from, I don't want to isolate people now because I'm going to forget somebody. But anyway, so a lot of faculty adoption strategies also emerging. And then, of course, what JP already mentioned. Um, about five years ago, 2013, we took a quite ambitious plan to council. And we said to council, would you be able to provide the funding for this very ambitious plan and strategy? And that's actually what I wanted to share with you this, this morning. Um, we asked them for 218 million. The total value of the project is 358 million. So we also said to them, we'll leverage some funds from donors and we'll invest some of the university strategic funds but we asked them for 218 million in May 2014, and that's when they gave us the 20, 218 million as well. And of course, one of the biggest challenges since 2013 has been to deliberate, and we're still deliberating, about the sustainability of this initiative. Because it's one thing to get, and I see you nodding heads, it's one thing to get that wonderful injection of money, it's another thing to say, uh, we've got to do it in a sustainable way. Okay, so we're going to touch on that as well. And I'm not saying today we've got all the answers. That's why we've got a colloquium. So any input um, is always welcome as to how to drive this forward. Okay, so let me quickly share with you the strategy, some implementation and results. Some of you might have seen some of these slides. I've updated it because the project, of course, is still running. So we've got to report back to council every six months as to what are we doing with their money. What's the impact? What are we achieving through their money? Okay, so in terms of our ICT strategy that JP also alluded to, uh, we had a vision in 2013 to have an ICT enhanced learning and teaching environment that uses ICTs effectively and efficient, efficiently to extend both the reach and the richness of the academic offering. So both in terms of moving out to possibly new knowledge markets, new, new um, delivery methodologies, but also to, to actually enhance the richness of the learning experience of the students. We wanted, therefore, to enhance the residential learning and teaching experience of the students, but also to be an enabler for new knowledge markets. We wanted to widen access with success. And we felt that ICT is a precondition for modern teaching and learning, as well as an enabler to reach new knowledge markets. Okay, so we put innovation in teaching and learning right in the center. And I think this is incredibly important. So that was, although it's about technology and learning technologies, this whole project, innovation in teaching and learning, that was the center of our whole project. Around that, we built six elements. The one, JP already um, referred to, lecture support or the renewal of targeted academic 
programs, then student support, because we really felt that was a necessary um, aspect that we had to um, enable as well. Learning technology systems, Johannes here, he's the um, project owner of that project, and he'll be able to tell you much more about what's happening in that project. I'm just going to touch on a few of the highlights there. Uh, networks and infrastructure, um, Wi-Fi, all of those types of things. I'll talk about more. Wi-Fi was very important. And then quite an ambitious project that will outlive the ICT Council project is a renewal of all our um, business systems. So Sun Students, Sun, our financial systems, our student information system. So again, the council money couldn't cover everything we wanted to do, but at least it gave it quite a good head start. Just a very small slide, and you can't read what, what at, what's at the top, and I can't read either because I'm getting older. But if you look at EduCourse, and just to put teaching and learning innovation again in the middle, right there at the top, that there says that one of the 2018 key issues in teaching and learning is academic transformation. And I find it so telling that after 20 years, it's finally moved up to spot one. I don't know if it was maybe last year it was spot one as well. But I remember distinctly, and I actually wanted to go back in the history, because I remember some of the key issues in the past used to be more around the technology systems. Okay, what LMS are we going, learning management system are we going to use? But this year and possibly previous years, EduCourse actually identified academic transformation as the key issue. And I think we really hooked onto that at Stellenbosch University because remember, although we're talking technology, we're talking academic renewal. And we hooked the ICT project closely with our academic program renewal project, which is also a five-year project um, that we kicked off last year, 2017, with 100 academics from 10 faculties or more than 100 academics from 10 faculties. We invited Jilly Salmon. She did a carpe diem on program level with, many, with, with yeah, more than 100 academics. And of course, that project is now still running, and we're using our University Capacity Development Grant funding to actually drive that project forward. So I want you to, to understand that what we were trying to do at Stellenbosch is to closely link academic program renewal, academic transformation, and our ICT in learning and teaching project, which is, which is key and crucial to us. So these two are very, very intimately linked. Okay, so having said that, what is the ICT project all about? As JP already mentioned as well, the renewal of targeted academic programs had a very important one, um, and there's quite a number of the blended learning coordinators in the room today. Uh, the total of 55 person here support for ICT in learning and teaching, you can ask JP more about that. Um, that but that baffles some people, but the way we calculated it is that from the ICT project, we actually appointed five blended learning coordinators for four years, which gives us 20 years from our teaching development grant, 16 times four, and then some of the faculties actually appointed their own blended learning coordinators, and that's how we actually made up the 55 person years. So this has been incredibly, incredibly successful because these blended learning coordinators work very specifically within faculties on the faculty specific uh, plans, but they also um, gather once a term, right JP, and also have very close links to the Center for Learning Technologies to form a team also on institutional level. So I must say this has been one of the really highlights driving the strategy forward. In terms of lecture support, JP already alluded to our MOOC. I'm looking at my time, so I'm not going to play you this. If I've got time at the end, I'll say something about the, the MOOC itself. Um, JP already alluded to it. I think what we learned through the MOOC, because the jury's still out, I mean, what do you want to achieve with MOOCs? But I think some very, very, very valuable lessons were learned in terms of what do we need to enable within the Center for Learning Technologies to do fully online design? Um, and I think 
that was one of the really, really key messages coming through this process because we realize it's radically different than, than just a blended learning um, design, but we really had to think differently about how we design learning opportunities in a fully online space. Lecture support continued. Um, as JP already mentioned, of course, this colloquium is a direct um, result of the ICT and Learning and Teaching project. There's also a blended learning short course. I don't know if there's going to be any case studies on that or alluded to. Sonia, I don't know if you're going to allude to that, but you'll probably just allude to that. Um, so I think Leanne, Leanne is also here. I saw Leanne earlier. <clears throat> also very involved in that if you want to know more about that. And then also additional user support capacity. So that's the first leg, first of the six. The second one was student support. We became acutely aware that we cannot just say we've got an ICT project, focus on the lecturers, but there's no support for the students. So a portion of the 218 million also went to this project, um, which consisted of three legs, expanded support um, organization, and that meant that we wanted to put technical staff within faculties, um, in the IT hub, as well as within specific faculties to assist students, um, as well as lecturers in the classroom. So I've got a problem, come and help my students quickly. And they are incredible. They've got a wonderful WhatsApp group, um, and they roam campus, and if there's an issue somewhere, they can go quickly to a classroom and assist where necessary. A new service desk, um, as well as the student tracking and this is a very, very busy slide, but this is one of the issues that we probably won't cover completely out of the ICT project, and we won't, because we'll also be using our University Capacity Development Grant funding for that, but we find that that's a <coughs> crucial idea to track our students, and I know a lot of other universities that we want to learn from has already got this right, so please put up your hands if you've already done this, in, um, implemented a student tracking system, because we would love to hear from you. We've got lots of little building blocks, but we want to put them together, and we would like to share a network around this. The Learning Technologies Project, again, Johan Kissner is the manager here, in brief, focused on the learning management system. We're currently using Moodle. It's our solid core for all blended and online learning. Rollout of the mobile client was quite important in this. Video streaming and capture, we, as you know, some of you know that we started with a Google development um, and then Google changed the app and we had to quickly in about a month or two switch gears and we started rolling out Adobe Connect, which is working quite well. The learning repository and content, content synchronization, the aim is the seamless integration with SunLearn. Interpreting over Wi-Fi, as you know, we've got quite a number of interpreters. Kim is here from the Language Center, if you want to know more about that. Um, but we've tried it over Wi-Fi. There's an unacceptable delay, and we're looking at other types of technologies, possibly streaming and then um, interpreting or translating. Short courses, online self-registration and payment. So you can see a number of projects running along that. The next slide I don't want to say too much about, and that's the renewal of our business systems. And this is a huge project. Professor Ian Klitter from Information Governance is the pro program manager there, with Ralph Pina, Freak Tritter from IT. And it's basically focused on the renewal of Sun Student, our whole student information system, as well as Sun Fin. And I see some colleagues from Northwest University. There's been quite a lot of collaboration with Northwest specifically in terms of our financial systems, but then also our student information systems. Second to the last one, key, key, key enabler, um, networks and Wi-Fi. Um, I promise you I can tell you so many stories, but a few years ago um, some new residences were built um, on campus. And you can guess, the students did not want to move in until there was Wi-Fi. Wi I mean, they didn't care if they would sleep on the floor um, or if there was a bed. But the first thing they said is their Wi-Fi. So I must say this has become a key issue at our university um, to provide um, networks, Wi-Fi. And this has also been quite an ambitious project because, of course, we've got to build a ship while it's moving. 
You can't just say we're going to decommission 20 classrooms, put in Wi-Fi, and then put everybody back in again. We don't have that spare capacity. So you've got to put in Wi-Fi networks while the academic year is actually <coughs> rolling along. So good to say you missed it. There were lots of trenches next to the roads that you could fall in. The trenches now is for the fibre to the homes, but there were trenches around the university. All the fibre routes are completed between buildings. Network rooms were upgraded. And our Wi-Fi picture, every time I get the picture from Joe Smith from IT, it's becoming more and more promising in terms of how far it's been rolled out. So that's really been an enabler. Last but not least, we were also quite ambitious when we asked council for money. Money, We said we also wanted a brand new teaching and learning centre, um, state of the art. Um, of course, it's much more than the budget of council allows for, so we also had to get donor funding. Um, so it's called the Jan Maton Teaching and Learning Centre. It's going to be built, if you've got some time, just on the other side of the Nielsen. There's at the moment no longer just a big hole, but they've actually, there used to be just a giant hole, but now there's actually some hay, uh, some, some piles going up, and there's lots of activity around the Nielsen. But I think it's really going to be state of the art. Bottom is going to be two lecture halls, huge. Middle is going to be four uh, large open computer user areas uh, with mobile, et cetera, et cetera, and the top is going to be two large auditoriums. Um, so we're really, we're really proud of this new building that's also been funded by um, the council project. Okay, so last but not least, um, the lessons learned through all of this. Um, and I think this is also an ongoing project at this stage because we're learning as we're going <laughs> along uh, continuously. I think in our case... Um, it needed to be context specific and I think we keep reminding ourselves that the academic project in teaching and learning should be remain the driver. The moment we start just thinking about um, the technology, I don't think we're going to be successful and that's why it's also so very, very, very tightly linked to our academic program renewal project um, that's kicked off in the faculties. Uh, I think also uh, the enabling context is incredibly important. The funding helped, the support from top management helped. So there's a lot of stuff that happened um, in that regard. I think the other lesson we learned, we needed to keep it integrated. Um, we needed that holistic, systemic approach. So we couldn't just go at one, for instance, lecture support or student support. We had to look at everything in a systemic matter, a manner. And in that systemic manner, the interdependencies and the synergies became apparent. Um, JP and his team would, and the faculties would say, yes, this is our faculty plan for implementation. In module X, we're going to do this, this, this. They would get into a classroom and there would be no Wi-Fi. Um, so that all the Wi-Fi wouldn't be working or the data projectors so that there wasn't any student support so nobody could actually come and help. So we really became acutely aware that we couldn't work in, in isolation. We needed to consult and we needed to, to work together. So those interdependencies and synergies became apparent and what really helped, we've got monthly meetings of all the project managers of these six projects and every two months, we've got an EXCO meeting. So then the Vice Rector Learning and Teaching joins, the CIO, the Chief, uh, not the Chief, the CFO, the Chief Financial Officer um, joins the meeting, the Registrar joins, so really the top management join every two months as well to keep all the strands together. I think it was also integrated because we've got a component of business as usual but then also long-term teaching and learning strategies. So we had to manage those in tandem as well. And then last but not least, I think the biggest, biggest lesson learned is the sustainability. And this is a conversation that is ongoing. We haven't got this right yet. But I do think that by having a, a strong project management structure and ownership by the different project owners, as well as full-time personnel in leadership, that are involved in this project. So we're not just getting consultants in and saying, um, do this for us, but it's actually people in the jobs implementing this strategy. I do think we'll get some um, sustainability. 
We also have regular reporting to council in terms of the governance structure. And then the last but not least, I think the most, the, one of the wicked problems as the New Horizon report would call it, is the financial sustainability of all of this. Um, just to give you an idea, this is how we think about the financial sustainability. Um, this is the total income from council. So there was a sharp increase, of course, as we got our funding, and we hope that it will taper off. And then the total income will hopefully pick up as we expand to new, for instance, new knowledge markets. So that was the council investment. And the project is running over, as any project is running over. It's supposed to be a five-year project, but we've extended it to May 2019. And I think some of the funding will extend possibly even beyond May 2019. And then we're looking at new knowledge markets. And this is the forward-looking part to also give us um, some type of further income for the university, for sustainability. And to this, um, this is my last slide, and this is where Professor Schoenwinkel will pick up um, this afternoon as well. We're looking to a hybrid delivery model in addition to the face-to-face. -face. So what we want to do is we want to leverage what we've learned and what we've done in the ICT project, so all the outcomes of this, um, innovation in teaching and learning, as well as the outcome of all of these um, projects as an enabler, plus our program renewal initiative. So as I already said, our academic program renewal initiative underlying all of that. And we want to, this is a little bit small, but I'll read it to you, enable then a hybrid model where we've got face-to-face -face block sessions with students, synchronous streaming. These students will not be on, on the campus the whole time. They would then again come to campus for face-to-face -face blocks and labs, then also supplemented with synchronous streaming, some more blocks, assessments, and of course, very, very important, 24-7 online tutor support for asynchronous. And I know that 24-7 is aspirational. I don't think we're going to get to 24-7, but uh, that's what we're here for. That's what we need to dream big. Um, and this is one of the models, the hybrid learning that we're looking at currently to also expand um, to new knowledge markets, um, additional income. Remember what I said at the beginning, one of our overarching aims was expanded access <coughs> with success. So we really want to widen access to Stellenbosch University whilst maintaining success and excellence. Um, and we believe that through this hybrid delivery model, we will be able to do it through our necessary enablers of ICT project plus our program, academic program renewal initiatives. So with that, I'm going to stop because I know Professor Schoenwinkel is going to start here again this afternoon. Um, and I've got about seven minutes left or nine minutes left for some questions and comments, please. Um, I'm sure, I hope there's some burning issues or just sharing your own experience at, as to what is happening at your university. Yes, Martin. Could you say a bit more about what you mean by this last slide? <laughs> Yes. Uh, that's where I want to say you'll have to wait till 2 o'clock. <laughs> I could tell you all of those things that's in the next two or three slides, um, but I'm, I'm leaving it as a teaser because um, Professor Squinwinkel will give you the aims, the target audience, what we're trying to achieve with it. So I'm really sorry. I would love to go into more detail because I really think this is where, we, where some exciting opportunities lie, but... Uh, I, I'm going to get into trouble if I steal his thunder this afternoon. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yes. I think, um, thanks for the presentation. Really interesting. It sounds like you're doing fantastic work. And I think it's very impressive to see the level of um, coordination and integration of what you're doing because you've got multiple projects in quite a lot of different you know, parts of the university which often don't work in a synchronized way. Yes. I just wonder if you could speak a bit more about that. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Can you talk more about that process? Yes. How hard it was or not? Yes. I think we had integration on a number of levels, and it, it was, it, 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 not it was, it is tricky. I don't think you'll ever uh, get past the trickiness of it. I think with regards to the project itself, we set up a very strict project governance, governance structure. So Professor Skoenwinkel is the owner of the project. I'm the overall coordinator of the project. And then each of the the legs that I showed you today as a project manager with the subsequent projects flowing from that. As I mentioned, once a month, I get together with all the project, those six people are um, responsible. So we have a meeting with an agenda, sharing feedback, where are the synergies, where are the risks, what's happening. And then on the top level, the governance level, we then get the EXCO together every two months. So that's where Professor Skoenwinkel is, Marnie Lombard, our chief financial officer, so to get that governance. Um, so that's the project itself. So I think to get the integration between that and the program renewal was also an interesting because there's definite synergies between those two. Luckily, um, we've got one division now, Division for Learning and Teaching Enhancement, which, which I head up. And within my division, I've got JP, Center for Learning Technologies, and I've got Nicolene, who's the acting director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. I've got Andre, who's here, who's the director of academic planning, and, uh, academic planning and quality enhancement, and Kim, who's head of the Teaching and Learning Center. So within my division, I also have the role players who liaise with the faculties. And since about 2013, 2014, we started following a very much devolved model where um, colleagues from the Center for Teaching and Learning are actually working part of their time within the faculties. And we formed really close partnerships with some of the vice deans teaching and all the vice deans teaching and learning. Some of them are here today. So those partnerships, both within the division, but then also moving out within the faculties and forming partnerships with the vice deans teaching and learning, really helped to get that synergy going. And then last but not least, a wonderful enabler to also move the research and teaching and learning closer together to even make it bigger is the University Capacity Development Grant, which is also jointly managed by myself and the Senior Director Research, Terina Tron. So we've managed now to start those conversations um, because the broader question that JP um, alluded to is scholarship. You know, how do you promote scholarship in teaching and learning? How do we promote research? So they, on that level, even a broader level. So there's lots of synergies, and I think it's a constant process to find out research, teaching and learning, teaching and learning, use of technology, um, links to faculties, those types of partnerships, synergies. So yes, uh, very, very, very interesting and incredibly exciting. Yes. Um, this might seem to be a technical question, but um, in terms of the synchronous streaming that you envisage yes. and the choice of the Dark Connect, yes. we do not share the same enthusiasm. We are, might, might either be doing something wrong <laughs> or you still have the lesson forthcoming. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, not. <laughs> why did you go this way? Um, I think it's, it was rolled out originally at our business school quite effectively as well as well as I think the arts faculty also had a server. Um, I don't see anybody from Yumarcha, Yayan. Oh, yes, there is somebody, Neil, at the back there. Um, so I think we've had, especially within the business school context, as well as an arts faculty, quite good success with the product. product. So there might be some conversations, you know, some things that we haven't hit yet that we haven't had a good experience with. We've also experimented with YouTube channel streaming as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of experiments going. Um, but at that moment, which was quite a crisis when our whole Google development uh, was no longer, <laughs> we had to get a platform going in about a month's time. It happened in November, and it, the, um, I got a WhatsApp from a management meeting saying, will you be ready to stream in January 20, was it Johan, was it 2016 or 2017? I can't even remember the years. 
2017. So I got a WhatsApp one day on my cell phone saying from a management meeting, will you be ready to stream in January 2017? And I nearly had a heart attack because I knew the Google stuff was not going well. And we basically rolled out, well, not we, um, IT in collaboration with Center for Learning Technologies um, during that holiday, November, December, and we were ready to stream in, in January. Okay, I see my time's up. Any other last burning issue question? I'm gonna be around and I'll have a glass of wine at the <laughs> symposium with you as well tonight. Looking forward to that. Thank you very much. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Schoenwinkel. That's con going to continue the presentation that I started this morning. As you know, um, Martin asked the very pointed, I didn't plant the question, I promise. Um, how does the hybrid model actually play out in general? Um, and I think this is where we stop this morning. So I'm going to hand over to Professor Schoenwinkel now to actually take it more on a general level as to how the hybrid delivery model, its aims and targets work. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, good afternoon. And from my side, uh, Welcome colleagues and especially welcome to all our visitors from other institutions. Um, so Antoinette this morning explained to you our approach that we had in Stellenbosch, which was, I think, and still is, quite a broad-based approach tackling a number of issues. What I will try to do this afternoon is to generalize that to what I think would be the kind of things that we are considering as institutions, and you will tell me whether, whether I'm right and there'll be an opportunity for some discussion and question afterwards. And um, then also try and think, so what can we do, coming from different institutions, um, on the theme of uh, a linked society of universities in South Africa who wants to apply digital technology? So um, I will talk about the so-called uh, hybrid delivery model and the aims and the, tar and the targets. And these are the aims that I think we all are thinking about, right? The first is that um, we are trying to package our current offerings, which very often is heavily towards face-to-face, -face, um, in new ways, in so-called blend and learning methodology, for new knowledge markets. And it would, I think, to a very large extent, include students who cannot come here full-time, who are in the learn and earn um, situation. Obviously, I think we want to build on our current strengths. If it's a, a residential university where students are expected to be here and we've got good programs, so-called face-to-face teaching, well, build on that. That's a logical thing. And, and expand that to the other markets. It is true that if one makes use of more online uh, offering, that those students will expect a great digital experience. But I think the same is true for our current students. They also expect that. So in that sense, it's really using technology for different markets, and both of them have very high expectations. And therefore, technology should work well to make all these ideals of ours possible. We also want to use time of our academics more efficiently, and I think we are actually, with the help of technology, being able to serve more and more students effectively. But if we think of expanding that to online markets, that will be, I think, even more true, that we'll be, have to be very careful with the time of our academics and support staff. And also use our year calendar effectively. And lastly, but not least, um, we are limited, at least in the South African sector, as to how many places we are funded for and infrastructure that we have. And this should enable us to escape from those sort of limitations. What are the typical target groups that I think you would also be considering that um, we are considering at Stellenbosch University? Well, first of all, if we modularize our academic offering and um, be able to spread costs and make it more affordability, I think we can now reach students in the workplace. And many of them have needs to update their knowledge, the classical way of thinking about it, and some of them want further quali qualifications. There are also many school leaders who nowadays cannot get into the selected few places that we offer for first years, but would like to, who may have come from a school situation which didn't prepare them adequately. This mechanism of hybrid education that we offer may enable more people to qualify. And I think the same applies to the next bullet point, and that is um, selection courses. 
how difficult it is in to get into some selection courses. And we don't always have the capacity to run special bridging years that people attend full time. This method of using hybrid teaching offering should also give students an opportunity to enter into our selection programs. Um, international students, and particularly we have a very strong focus and I think also an obligation to cooperate in Africa and extend our offering and also have other good institutions and offerings from Africa being shared to our own South African learner community. So those are the kind of target groups that um, we have in mind and probably they overlap a lot with what you have. But we can discuss that, see whether we miss anything. Um, I just want to again show that picture, you are all aware of it, that um, our continent, and especially the part in sub-Saharan Africa, is um, in the world the continent where the average age is in the teens. That should give us a massive opportunity. And then if you go beyond that, the next age, gr age group, again, we in South Africa and Northern Africa, are the, uh, we are the continent that have the young people who need to be educated. So I think we sit in a fantastic position for what we intend doing as institutions. Another topic that I will introduce um, is what are the opportunities for linking up the hybrid and the face-to-face -face offering? And there are a multitude, just to list a few that you may have thought of, but that we are um, certainly um, considering, is that um, as we will podcast most of our lectures, that's an opportunity not only for our hybrid learners, the ones who are in a blended online and block um, contact situation with us, but obviously also for our face-to-face -face students. So it's well worth making that investment. Another um, two-way spin-off opportunity is that if we are knowledge, uh, develop these knowledge bytes, and I'll call them small pockets of information that stays more or less the same, um, that immediately gives the opportunity to utilize that for students in both modes. Again, well worth digitizing at least some of it in combination with podcasts where we will have uh, students experiencing being present and being able to participate in the actual real-time lectures as they happen or after hours if they can't attend it in real time. We have quite a challenge here that students who've tried a few times are not readmitted re to the program. I think most institutions come to that point where you need to tell a student this does not seem to work in the traditional way. Time to leave the program. And what we often tell those students as sort of a, a, a consolation is if you can take the same module at another institution and do well, you can come back. But how difficult is that? The, the, the match and the overlap is often not that great. But if we would digitize some of our knowledge and put that available online and offer the students, you may, in the next six months, take this, redo this module online, prove yourself with a number and a certain workload, able to readmit. I think it's a much fairer and a much more doable offer. And that's where, again, we have the opportunity to work. The other way, it can also work the other way around. Um, we may have students who cannot afford to be full-time. They do a number of our modules um, part-time in the blended mode, in the hybrid mode. And at some point, they say, all right, I now want to finish my program. And they can come back and do a full-time residential um, attendance. The need for teaching assistance is greater and greater. We find that with our current student, they want more opportunities to revise. We have to order, organize more tutorials. Therefore, we need more staff. And the idea, of course, with a um, hybrid is that we will have a number of support staff, teaching assistants, available online. The point is they could also obviously serve our own students, the full-time residential students, the current ones, by being available online. So there's another two-way spin-off. What I find really exciting is that um, there would be opportunities, if you talk about um, collaborative learning, for a young full-time student to be connected on a collaborative learning platform with a student who's in the workplace. And can one think about the enrichment and the opportunities to understand what's happening out there and the perspectives from someone in the workplace shared with the perspective of someone who's a young student just listening to the, theory of the theories of the professor, I think there are great opportunities. So um, this two-way opportunities I think are really exciting. To conclude, there's this um, little slide here. 
Um, the hybrid learning rests on two pillars, I think. The one is, obviously, we need the technology. But the basis should be a drive to renew our programs, to offer it in a new way. And all three of these legs should be in place. But to my mind, the focus is a drive to renew our programs. Um, we have to do it in a way that is relevant to the South African context. Take the realities into account, such as not everybody is equally well connected digitally. Um, we can definitely look at the international market. We can certainly focus on, South, on Africa's needs. And then I think there are great flexible learning opportunity spin-offs for our residential students. So us, as people who are meeting for this conference, how can we co collaborate? Well, first of all, we do not need to offer the same thing um, to the same market from multiple institutions. We can pick the best amongst ourselves and offer, offer that. And I believe we've had some presentations on that. So there's a great opportunity for networking. We, once we digitize some modules, why don't we share it amongst our, ourselves, make that available for our students at the various institutions? Um, lots of support goes in with this. We may be able to support it. I'm thinking about, for instance, ven venues for assessment, if we need that, um, other kinds of networks. And then learning centers, um, specialist learning centers in digital technology application. There's a lot of know-how around. We may be able to share that. And I hope that by at least meeting here, as interest people in this field, we will make the contacts to make that possible, but also in practice, see where we can share information and really make this um, uh, African digital university integration. Thank you very much for allowing me to make this short bridge. Um, how many minutes do we have? A few minutes, JP? Five minutes. We've got uh, five minutes. Okay, good. <clears throat> right, time to interact and ask questions. <laughs> just, okay. I just want to find a kind of view. What, system, what do you think is the perception, the current perception of students when, when they compare, say, face to face to an online course? You know, what, what would swing them to go either way? Um, my. Uh, opinion is um, if students could afford it or someone can help them afford it to be full-time finish a degree in the short time being able to rub shoulders with fellow students um, with top-class academics that would probably be the preference but the realities of many students are different it's not possible they can't afford for instance the residence component at a university but they may want to have interaction with the top academics so I do think the second one is probably um, only possible for some students, not necessarily preferred. And that puts the obligation on us to make sure that whatever we are good at in face-to-face -face transfers as well as we can to the online student in the hybrid mode. And make sure that since they have to interface with us digitally, that is a very positive experience. But I think the first one would still be preferable for those who can afford it. Yes. The, the, the hybrid model still involves contact, is it? Yeah. So, is, there, is, there, is, it, is it does it minimize, or do you see it as being absolutely essential to your model that you have to have, you know, the substantial contact for traveling there and engaging with the university? So, is that not the natural yeah. so, thinking of the market? Yeah. So, that's why we use the term hybrid um, here. Because um, one can say the full-time face-to-face is the one end of the spectrum and the other end of the spectrum is purely online. There's no physical uh, sharing the same space at the same time. By hybrid, we think that we should still try and exploit the value of being um, in the same place at the same time. And uh, the classical way is by organizing block sessions especially in the part of the academic calendar, which is not utilized at present by full-time students, at least an introductory block. So that one can set up the program, get the students to know each other, get personal contact with whoever will assist with their administration, with their teaching assistants and so on. Get, I think that will be an important contributor, and that's what I mean by, by hybrid. 
And then, um, especially if you think of practical courses where there's field work or some clinical work or some engineering laboratory work, obviously that has to happen at, a, at an equipped facility. And that's where I think hybrid will not only be uh, beneficial, but be essential. And uh, that's for me, getting the right blend is the trick in getting the right hybrid for the right kind of drug that we offer. We have time for one more um, question. Ferrat and Paul. Uh, this initiative creates the impression that there is a southern African target, um, not an African target. Mm -hmm. And if that is so, it, it would work. But as soon as you move into the, the African states, um, connectivity, technology access is, is highly suspect. Having worked in Africa for a mm. year in at least four large countries, you get nodes of enthusiasm, <coughs> Wi Fi, connectivity, but then towards your regional areas in any of those countries. And that's a typical rubber stamp experience that I'm talking about. Uh, it needs very little um, to work with. Uh, if, if you do not consider to expand more than or to the more than Sub-Saharan type of context, this model would work. Otherwise, uh, expect a number of challenges. Mm. We realize that it's, it's true um, even in our own country where you cannot, even though you have this intention and you have a vision for the university to extend your offering to include more, and the reality is often different. But at least we want to make sure that if we find these places where it is possible because of infrastructure, because of the kind of associations that we already have, that we will be able to share our knowledge by making use of a digi digital interface. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we understand the technical challenges sometimes. So-called digital divide. Mm -hmm. sure. Thank you.